sports card fans. Welcome back to another episode of Two Guys, One Hobby. How you doing, Don? I'm doing well, John. How about yourself, buddy? Well, could be a little bit better. Uh, was getting ready for work this morning and was in the, the shower. And my wife comes in, uh, you're, you're, you're done rinsing down, right? I'm like, yeah. She says, turn the water off. I'm like, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, we just got a leak in the ceiling from the bathroom upstairs and water was dripping down and all over a table with paperwork and the, all that stuff and it wasn't coming down like niagara falls but it i think it had been dripping for quite some time so we got the plumber over and now there's like a two by two foot hole in our ceiling i told her we're working on a skylight system so how, uh, this how did your pipe burst i mean it's warm out right now was it are, are they copper it was or are they where this had been one a, a very slow little drip leak probably for a couple of years and we just didn't notice it and then there's just enough he could the, the plumber really couldn't find the leak we, he thinks it was like a hairline fracture in a, a small pvc pipe we thought it was coming from the shower it was actually coming from the vanity the faucet the hot water and just a, a freak Thing. So, yeah, we're trying to work on finishing building our house and our current house is starting to fall apart. It's we have ghosts saying, don't move, don't leave or else I'm going to. Yeah, I think so, they're telling you to leave. It's like, yeah, well, that well, that could be it as, as well. How many PSA 78 tops did that cost you that you could have bought that you had to pay the plumber? Uh, well, I haven't gotten the bill yet, so oh. I don't know. And then, of course, we have to patch the ceiling and do all that stuff. So, sure. yeah, that's been my wonderful day. However. On the positive side, I have a card to show off. It has a direct involvement with our guest today. Do we have a guest? Box Legends. Oh, we do. Okay. Yeah, we do have a guest. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, now, full disclosure, I was the main winner in Shane's recent contest. All right. Now, that had no impact on him being our next guest yeah right because i already had him in mind before he picked his winner although don and i are open to bribes so if you want to be the next guest you know slip a little something under the table i you have know. noticed you you win quite a few vr contest i have been very lucky uh i hey. think i've taken over lou rock's spot he used to win all the, the contests hey. Hmm? So you cheat is what you do. I don't cheat. Yeah, I well, don't cheat. You bribe them. You're doing yes. something. So uh, I won. Uh, Shane was very generous and with his uh, first place prize of a fifty dollar eBay gift card. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. I had a eBay gift card uh, recently for my birthday from my sister. I had a little bit of PayPal money, and that was the only way at this point I was able to get this one card, and I, I'm able to show it off here. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that at, at some point here, but let's get our guest on. Um, I've been following his channel. We've, he's been on for about two years. Uh, I've been on for about three. So I, I started watching his when he came on, uh, followed my channel and back and forth. Great, diverse collection. And we'll have him talk about it as well. But let's get the Shane Shoebox Legends on. Shane, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you guys? We're good, man. Glad to have you. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. I, I enjoyed the first uh, installment with Nina. It was awesome getting to know more about her and uh, honored honored to uh, be on as a guest. So thank you. Yeah, a sec second awesome. guest. Um, so uh, as usual, we have our guests to sort of choose the topics that they want to talk about, what uh, inspires them about the hobby, what their interests are, and so on. And you picked two really good uh, topics that we'll get in here over, say, the next uh, hour. Uh, we're going to be talking about cards that have either special meaning to us or basically are a, a tied to a memorable event, season, or moment. It doesn't have to be a superstar Hall of Fame card. It, something that is just maybe special to us or has some special mm -hmm. meaning to the game or whatever. Uh, so really broad uh, topic there, but I think some areas that we can talk about. And then... Something I think a lot of collectors struggle with, and something we'll we'll, we'll talk about here uh, briefly, is do we ever lose focus? Um, 
you know, a lot of collectors, they say, yeah, I'm, I'm focused on this, but invariably it's like squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> and, and we go over here and over there. And then suddenly we're like, wait, how did I get over here? And do you go back? Do you add it on? So how do you, do you, we lose our focus? And then if so, how do we get back or do we incorporate things and things like that? So, um, and I have a trivia question. I don't know if either one of you have a trivia question. It's fairly easy. Um, we'll see. Um, so, uh, Shane, how about we start with, you know, telling us a little bit about yourself, your collection, your time on YouTube and so on. Sure. So, uh, as you said, I've been on about two years now, um, but I've been in the hobby as an adult for about 15 years. Uh, I was in like the blogging community. There's a whole group of people that write uh, sports card blogs, very similar to the YouTube community. So I did that for about 12 years and a couple of years back, kind of wanted to change a pace and uh, had a, a few buddies that were doing this and started up a channel. And um, it's been great just getting to meet people like the two of you and uh, interacting with all the awesome people on the platform. I'm, I think I've had more fun in the hobby the last two years than uh, I've ever had at any point in my life. So uh, really glad that I jumped into the fray and uh, it's, it's been great. I, I collect, as you said, all kinds of stuff, um, vintage, modern, baseball, hockey, non-sports, graded, ungraded, autographs, you know, what? Yeah. almost anything which is a kind of an issue which is why the focus is uh, yeah. one of the topics i wanted to pick your brains on right uh, yeah that's yeah, you, uh, that's pretty much i guess a high level summary <laughs> yeah you you brought up a good, a good point what don no go ahead oh yeah you, you brought up a good point about you know getting on youtube and i i, I hear that all the time that you, you got on youtube you maybe just did even a few videos or just interacted, whether it's just maybe starting off by commenting on someone's videos and then maybe taking the leap and, and doing your own videos and, and how that has increased your enjoyment of the hobby. I, I, I know for me, other than a few weight box collectors that, you know, I'd met before we text or, or talk, um, I really didn't have anyone to share or get involved in with, with my collection. It was just me. And I mean, I still enjoyed it, but there was no real interaction. And now YouTube is, I mean, it's just exploded in terms of people I've, I've met, interacted with, become friends with, um, and just share collections, watch their videos and stuff. And it, it's just, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It's just been amazing. Yeah, I, would, I would actually say as a, oh, sorry, Don. I was just going to say, that's kind of where I was going with this too. I think there's just about all of us feel the same way that, um, you know, our collecting experience is so much better because of YouTube. Um, you know, I've been to two nationals. I, I doubt I would have went to either one. I say, I know I would not have if it was just on my own, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I would say as an added wrinkle it was almost like twofold for me. The, the first two years I showed my hands and cards only. I'm, I'm a pretty big introvert and yeah. I, I just was, you know, felt weird being on camera, but uh, past few months kind of stepping out of my comfort zone and doing some things like this, it's actually made it even that much more uh, enjoyable in the interaction. Yeah, I agree. I, I think people feel like they get to know you. At least I do when I see people. You know, there's still a couple of channels out there that have never shown their face and I've never met in person that I'm like, man, I wish you knew what that person looked like. Because you can just, you know, now we can put a voice or a collection to the face and if we run into you somewhere, it's like, oh, hey, there's Shane. You know, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it took I, I me thought a while you had started off, off. but I'm, I'm glad I yeah, did. <laughs> I thought you started off just, you know, just showing and and just in, you know behind the scenes. And I think that that's how maybe I just started, started. started. But I think a lot of people start that way. They're like, okay, I'm going to do a video, but I I don't want to be on. I'm going to make a fool of myself. But I'll just put the camera out there and I'll just show cards and and stuff. And that's a you know baby step to to take. And then, uh, as as Don said, it's I much prefer seeing the the, the people on you know maybe you know, switching views back and forth and stuff, but still being able to see like so that's what Shane looks like in a face to a voice. And because you hear a voice like man, I wonder what they look like and stuff and all. That. So yeah. So, so one one last that. thing related to that. This is probably a compliment you haven't been given before, at least from from this audience. But my dad, who's seventy five. He watches a lot of my videos and he stumbled upon some of yours, John, uh, way back. They must have been in, you know, in the feed recommended or something. And he's actually commented to me multiple times how he loves your setup and, you know, the view where you can see the card on the mat and your face. 
you know, at the same time. And uh, so, yeah, my dad's a fan of, uh, of your channel. <laughs> well, well, Tom, thank you. So. <laughs> well, you two are just ass kissers. <laughs> Winning contest. Well, he's, he's not that great. $50 <laughs> eBay gift card is all it takes. You know. Yeah, and I, I think she, weren't you, you were the winner of one of my earlier contests, right? I don't know if it was the first one, but very... Yep, what, one of the first contests I ever won on, on YouTube was your, I think it was your 400 subscriber okay. contest and uh, got an eBay gift card. And I, I told myself I wanted to buy something Wade Boggs related so that I would remember, you know, where, where it came from. And I actually pulled it out for the episode, but I, I bought the, uh, you know, autographed Wade Boggs rookie card. Um, and now when I look back on it, it you know, reminds me of win winning that contest. So, okay. Well, before we get into the topics, I think maybe now would be a good time since we're talking about the eBay gift cards, winning the contest, buying a card for that. Um, I'll show off maybe the special card or is it, or, or should, I, should I leave the suspense for later or just do it now? <laughs> Let's see it. Uh, Let's all see right. It. All right. This is one of the cards in my 100 cards for a $100,000 list. Nice. It's also a year that I do not have a graded card from. So one of my goals this year in 2023, there were four sets that I didn't have a graded uh, Hall of Fame uh, card uh, player card from. And so this checks off two boxes. One of the 100 cards for $100,000. It's from... Oh, I, I just, I, oh my God, I just love this. I'm going to, whoop, I got to put, eh, where is it here? Uh, Solo Leia, here we go. It is. Nice. Five tops. Killer Brew rookie card. There you go. Great card. 3.5. Check that centering out. I check, I can't <sighs> find a single crease or blemish on that card. What a copy. And the back is, you know, maybe a little bit, you can see maybe a little bit of staining. There. I mean, it's, but oh my gosh, seriously, for a 3.5? Yeah, no doubt. And great. the only way I was able to get this, again, so Shane, thank you. And I have to thank my sister. Uh, I had a birthday not too long ago. She sent me a $30 eBay gift card. I was holding on to that for maybe something special. Then I win Shane's contest. Then I had a little bit of money in PayPal, and I'm like, you know what? I can now get this without too much additional money out of pocket. And I just, oh, the colors, and when I saw it in the centering, I'm like, dude, how is that a 3.5? That is so, beautiful. Yes. I am, well, there, there we go. I'm so excited. So I, this is my first 55 Tops Hall of Fame. Really? Nice. Um, so what are the other three sets that you need a card from? I needed a 63 Fleer, and I picked up the Kari Stremski. Okay. So now so I'm down to a 48 Bowman and a 54 Bowman. I don't okay. have either a 48 Bowman or a 54 Bowman Hall of Fame graded card. Do you have specific players in mind for those sets? No. Or just, no. just you like? I mean, it, that, yeah. Now, I do have a 48 Bowman Red Shane Deist uh, ungraded that's really beat up. I bought when I was a kid. Uh, from my local card shop for like six bucks. I mean, it's off center. There's pencil writing that was erased. It's, it's if it grades, maybe de definitely no more than a one, if not an authentic or something like that. It's okay. What was the Bowman you bought at the Pittsburgh show? That was the 49 Bowman spawn. It was 49. Okay. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I am. So, so Shane, thank you again. I'm so excited to that. That's one of those cards where I remember as a kid going through the, the price guides. This is back in the mid to late in the 80s. I'd always go back to the cards from the 50s and 60s. And every once in a while, they'd, they'd have a little image for the 55 set and they'd have yep. a Killer Brew rookie. And I, I, I've i always, I've never been like a big Killer Brew fan, but that rookie card is is one in the back of my mind. I'm like, I, I've one day I, I want to own. And so now I have it part of my collection and I'm, so excited about it so that's awesome I, i've been a big fan of your uh you know 100 for 100k series so it's really cool that the the gift card from the vr got to contribute to that that's awesome yeah this is card number 35 so then i'll do another summary of the last 10 and when you first made that video i was like that's a great idea and i started a spreadsheet working on it 
and I saved it in Google Drive, you know, 100K cards or something. And my wife somehow saw it. She's like, you spent dollars I'm like, do you think I have $100,000 somewhere? I didn't know. Like, no, and no. Yeah. I did not spend 100000 on cards, and I don't have 100000 like, yeah. oh, it, yeah. it It's amazing how things like this start off, like projects, and we can – that's sort of like the second part here with with, with focus and stuff. Um, I, you know, I tell everyone I just did it as initially a one off video. Right. If I had a hundred thousand, if I could take a, a case of cash of a hundred thousand dollars to like the national, what would I spend it on? What would be my dream cards to spend that hundred thousand dollars on? And I put that list together, and I was like, okay, it's done, and move move on. And the more I looked at it, I'm like, I, that list. Yeah, I'm like, you know what, I. I can afford that one. I, I can buy that one. I can if I save up a little bit. I can buy that one. I mean, there there's some up there that yeah, fifty two manual, the forty eight or forty nine leaf Robinson. I mean, there's some that like yeah, no. Um, <laughs> but I could probably I don't say easily, but over the next five ten years, maybe get close to seventy five percent. It's pretty good. Hey, I'd be happy with that. Yeah. So and that's become another focus. For as part of my vintage collect, help me focus a little bit on what I look for for vintage. So, but let's get to the maybe the first uh, topic here you want to talk about. So, cards with a special meaning. We we all tend to talk about or discuss, um, you know, the, the Hall of Famers or the big uh, big players in the in the game, whether it be baseball, hockey, football, you know, you name it. Um, you know, the key cards, the most expensive cards, or the you know rookie cards, or this or that. And that's all great. But I think for a lot of us as, as collectors, there are some cards out there that just have a special meaning to us. Maybe not valuable. Maybe we have it in a, in a just a terrible condition, but it means so much to us. Um, and that's also a part of, of collecting and being part of the hobby. So Shane, if you want to, uh, I don't know if you want to get, get into this uh, and show off some cards or, or things like that. or Yeah. So I, um, I, I just kind of got to thinking about it as like another, maybe a, a way that you don't think about as often in terms of how to approach collecting. Like if, if you ask somebody on like Family Feud, you know, name, name methods that people use to collect baseball cards, they're probably going to say, you know, set collector. You know, John, obviously with your Wade Boggs collection, you might say player collector. Don, you might say team collector of the, the Pirates. Those are, you know, the most common themes that you hear. But I think, you know, collecting moments or significant events, you know, in the game is kind of just a cool way to to go about collecting that you don't maybe hear as much about, or maybe a lot of us do it, but we don't think about it explicitly. We kind of do it subconsciously. And it's kind of a fun way to guide a collection or, or form a collection. And uh, like one example I have here, just to kind of get it started is uh, Rick Wise, the, the pitcher for the Phillies. So I, I never heard of this guy growing up. He played before I was even born. Um, didn't know anything about him, but a few years back, I heard about his amazing game in 1971 where he pitched a no-hitter and in the same game hit two home runs on offense, you know, to, to, to win the game. And so uh, to me, I'm like, that is one of the most dominating individual days in sports I could, I could ever imagine. And because of that, I kind of formed a little, a mini Rick Wise collection. And like, you can get his cards for, you know, dirt cheap. These are just you know, common cards, 1969 tops, 1970 tops. These probably cost me a dollar, um, but it's just an example of like a player that I never would have known about or gravitated towards until I learned about that one event, you know, in history that was just so impressive that it kind of cemented itself in my mind. And I just went about collecting his cards. And, you know, the other point I wanted to make, you know, I have other examples and before we kind of open it up is, being in a lot of different collecting circles, like varied circles, I do modern and vintage and graded and all these things, it, especially in the past few years in certain circles with like, you know, ultra modern guys and prospecting, like the hobby almost gets a little bit like disassociated from the actual game of baseball. And it's almost like, you know, betting on horses or all this speculation. And so right. I think co collecting this way is a good way to like, take us back to our roots of probably why most of us got interested in collecting to begin with, which is, you know, loving the game of baseball and, and the history of baseball. It has the best history, the most esteemed history of, you know, any major sport, certainly here in the 
United States. And I think a, a reason a lot of us collect is to celebrate that history and kind of have a, a representation of that history in our collection. And so I think, you know, whether you form an entire collection based on that approach or, you know, you kind of alluded to this um, with your your uh, 100 cards for 100K being a way to filter your focus, I think you can do the same thing with this. And, and they can be big, big players too, but they don't have to be. Um, so one example, I, I wanted to bring at least a vintage, you know, a couple of vintage cards to the table. Years back, I was, I was looking to get a Mickey Mantle card because, you know, it kind of feels like a rite of passage if you're trying to form a really awesome vintage collection to get a mantle. But yep. e even way back then before the bubble and, you know, everything that's happened, I couldn't afford a 51 Bowman rookie or the 52 tops. But thinking about it more, it's like, well, I can afford the 56 tops. It was a little bit of a, a stretch, but, you know, a, a small fraction of what those other two cards go for. So this, while it required, you know, some planning at the time and it, you know, was not a cheap buy, it was within range for me. And to me, when, when you consider the season that he had in 56, winning the Triple Crown, yep. winning the MVP, winning the World Series, you know, in a way you could say this card is kind of as cool or as significant, just in a different way as those iconic rookie cards. It's not the rookie card. It doesn't have the value. Oh, there's a beautiful copy too. Yeah. That's um, a great card. So, you know, that, that's a case where you can use, you know, the history of the game as a way to kind of filter and narrow down, you know, your options and maybe find something that, you know, is kind of fits the bill on your budget. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people who actually cite this as like their favorite Mickey Mantle card, even people who own the 51 and the 52, just because of that season and, and the awesome yeah. Uh, yeah. image that's on it. So, you know, whether you use it to, to form a whole collection like I did with Rick Wise or to apply it as a filter towards something else you're collecting, I think you can really do either either thing. I, I You raise a really good point, Shane, about I, I think sometimes us as collectors, and you can even, if you, if you want to uh, maybe broaden it to the, the dealers, flippers, investors, whatever, is even as, as collectors, I think we can get just lost in the card like especially maybe not for vintage as much but for modern it's well look at the patch look at the odd it's a it's a what the art rpa rookie patch auto or something like that and this of this player and so and it, it it becomes more about the card the card's important okay but i i could definitely see how for for some people maybe not for everyone where the card takes on more importance than the actual player or what the player is currently doing. If it's a modern card had done in the past. Um, that's one of the things why I, I, I like when people show off, uh, I don't have many, but their T2 a six collection or, you know, the, the pre-war, just the stories behind those players. Uh, some of those uh, uh, pictures, um, it was at uh, Eddie Joss and uh, was it Rue Mark, uh, Rube, Rube Waddell, Rube Waddell. Yeah. you know, one of the two, one of the two was just like crazy and would run after train. I mean, just, just weird, bizarre stories of some of the legends of the game. And it, yeah, to have a card, oh, it's a cool card. Look at the colors, you know, tobacco card and the size and all that's neat. But the player, you know, if you take the time to research and look into it, oh, he's a Hall of Famer. Hey, look at my card. You learn so much about it. And I think you can appreciate the card a lot more by you know tying it and, and looking into that player as opposed to oh I you know I have a now I have a Harmon Killebrew rookie card. Well hey great well okay well yeah he's a Hall of Famer 500 home run uh, member you know essentially except for his very last year essentially played for one team throughout his uh career moving to different cities of course but um it, it just Finding out more about that player, I think, can can make your collecting experience better. Yeah, totally agree. Um, this is another, you know, I, I think a pretty important one when, when you think about it in that respect. And it brings up another question that I wanted to ask you two about, because I've had this debate with some other friends. But like the 61 Roger Maris, mm -hmm. um, obviously, like one of the most important seasons in the history of baseball, uh, you know, recently surpassed, obviously, by Judge. But um, you know, this you can you can get the 61 Roger Maris card for a fraction of what you can get his 58 rookie card for. 
And to me, it's it's just as cool of a card when you think about everything he went through that summer and the pressures he was facing and the people that didn't want him to, to break the Babe's record or or they wanted Mantle to break it instead. And just uh, you know, this this card summarizes that that whole season. And uh, you know, I think it's if you don't have the money for a Roger Maris rookie card, maybe you, you go for something like this at a fraction of the price, and it still has that uh, that really cool story behind it. Or yeah, the, the free rate of collection. Um, I, I've never done that, um, but I think it's kind of awesome. You know, maybe like you said, you know, great seasons tied with cards. I never thought of buying the '61 Maris, but it it makes a lot of sense. You know, or maybe the year Ricky Anderson broke Lou Brock's record, or you know, whatever yeah. it may be. You know, the '67 Yaz because of the Triple Crown year. You know? yeah, that's another great one. Um, right. Maybe the. the the question, the, the debate I've had about this with, with buddies that I'd be curious if you have an opinion on or anybody in the comments, you know, for a card like this where he hit 61 and 61, is it cooler to have the card from 1961, you know, that was coming out in packs that summer as he was doing it? Or would you prefer, some people prefer the 1962 card where you can look on the back and see the 61 home runs? And from what I've heard, it seems like about a 50-50 split in terms of which one people would prefer. Yeah, that's like a personal preference. Like, I don't think you can go wrong on either one. Um, I kind of like the 61 card, not for the looks of it, just the 61 in 61, hit 61. I, I think it's kind of cool. I know he hit 61. I don't need the 62 to tell me that. Um, but I can also see people liking to have it on there. But the 56, you, the mantle you just showed, that, that was his – Triple Crown season. They don't say, "Hey, I want to have the '57 card to right. see the stats from '56." Right. You don't right. see that discussion yet. It appears it's a it's a more of a discussion for Maris. So yeah, why I, not? Uh, I think you're right. It is only mantle. certain cards that it you know comes to bear on, and and I guess it's one where it's more reliant on the stat line. Although I know the mantle is as well with the Triple Crown, but um, yeah, it's just an interesting debate. I've, I've had kind of an equal number of people tell me they'd prefer like the 62 so they can see the number 61 on the back. I've always been in the camp of liking the the 61 because I kind of think back to, you know, little kids pulling that out of the pack during the summer while they're watching the chase and, and enjoying the, you know, the drama behind that. So I think the best way to do it is get one of each. <laughs> yeah. Or, or the, 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 62, the 62 home run leaders card. Yep. So that has Maris and Manta. There you go. I was wondering if you if you had that. I don't have that. Um, yeah, and and again, that's another, like, to me, this is, when you really think about the history behind it, this is one of the coolest cards of the 1960s period. Um, yeah. And, and like, th this cost, I bought this within the last year for under $100. Um, a nicely centered copy, and, you know, you can't approach a, a rookie card of uh, Maris or Mantle for even anywhere near that, so it's just... Uh, there's a trivia question for you. With the, the, the battle in 61 between Maris and Mantle, who finished, what Hall of Famer finished third in the American League in home runs? And it was Herman Killebrew. Yeah, right, right there, there floating out on the bottom. Yeah, right. uh, answer that, John. Appreciate it. Because everyone, everyone remember 61, Maris made Mantle, Maris Mantle, Maris Mantle. And I well, made Killebrew hit. Yeah. Do you know? Hmm? How many oh. did you it? Yeah. I can tell I you right now. 45, uh, 46 looks like. I mean, not bad year, yeah. but I mean, 46. That who was number four and five? Bad. I think we can guess who four and five are. Does it go that far? Oh, yeah. Okay. It goes, if, if you want to venture, I guess, at four and five. Uh, Four is on the card. I, I, I Well, actually, so, like... yeah, Killebrew was tied with another player for third. I don't okay. remember Russ was on the card, do you? No. Okay, so good. So Kill Killebrew was tied with uh, Jim Gentile for Baltimore. Oh, okay. And oh, then, no. uh, so I guess fifth place technically then was uh, Rocky Calavito. Yeah, but oh. I guess either one. And then, I, so I have one more, um, like, kind of bigger name Hall of Famer vintage card that I think is a good example of this. And it's it's the only time in history that I'm aware of, and it's, it's famous for this, where – Tops produced a card for a moment before the moment actually happened. Oh, I know it's, it's, it's the 74 Hank Aaron, you know, home yes. run king card. 
Um, so I, I just love, you know, this is well known, but I love the story behind, you know, Tops kind of gutsily including that, you know, to kick off the set before he had actually set the record. Um, yeah. And again, you know, even more extreme example than anything we've talked about so far, even a low grade Hank Aaron rookie is going to cost you a few thousand dollars yeah. and you can get a, a low to medium grade of this for 50 bucks. Yep. And it, you know, signifies one of the most important things that he did in his career. So can you imagine if something freak happened that he never played a game in 74? <laughs> and can you imagine the 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 interest and value of that card? Oh, that card. I, I Just, mean I guess there's a ton of them, so the rarity probably isn't there. Yeah, but the, not the rarity. Yeah, you get it right. You, but it was totally the demand for that card. Oh yeah, it, it would be like the vintage baseball version of the losing Super Bowl team T-shirts that all get sent overseas. Right. You know? right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And then, uh, so th those are three vintage examples. But one of the things I also like about this approach, if you are somebody like me that collects across all different eras, it's a you can apply this to cards right up to the modern day. So we looked at. Uh, the Roger Maris, th this is a card uh, much like your big one that you showed, John. This arrived in the mail today, uh, mm -hmm. just in time for the show, but it's a perfect example. It's the 2022 Tops Aaron Judge. It's the Independence Day parallel, which is numbered out of 76 um, every year. But I wanted to get a significant Judge card just based on what he did, mm -hmm. you know, last season, hitting, breaking that record exactly 61 years later and uh, all the drama that went along with that. It's obviously a super important and historic season. Um, and so I'm not going to super collect Aaron Judge. I don't feel the need to go out and buy a hundred of his cards, but I wanted one nice example of a really significant 2022 Aaron Judge card. Found a nice serial numbered one. The Yankees are America's team. And this is, you know, Independence Day, red, white, and blue theme, low serial numbering. So just a cool way to kind of extend this method yeah. of collecting from you know, all the way to the beginning of baseball and pre-war right up to stuff that's happening today as, you know, history is being written this season that we're in. Right. Well, I know uh, James Elite Hunters, he's, it's maybe not quite the same thing, but I know he's been, been doing many collections of uh, cards of all the uh, MVPs or Cy Youngs for that right. year. Now, granted, you're going to get a lot of Hall of Famers in there, but there's some non-Hall of Famers and sort of like one-time Flash in the pan had a great season, won an MVP. And you go, who's this guy? Who like Dale Murphy, you know? the Pirates won an MVP one year, or you know Dale Murphy. We people know who he is, but he's not a Hall of Famer. But he won two MVPs. Yeah, there's all kinds of cards like that. Yeah, we're yeah. we're we're incredibly on the same wavelength here because this is one that I actually had in the stack, you know, to get to, but. This is the '65 yeah. you know, Zoilo Rosales. I, I don't know. I may be mispronouncing that, but yeah, I mean. Last guy you would think that would win an MVP, you know, off forgotten, not somebody you'd think of, but you can get, I looked this up earlier today, just for reference. You, if you're not condition picky, you can go on eBay and get a copy of this delivered to your door for $2. Yeah. Um, and, this, and, and that's the season he won the MVP. Um, right. It's just how cool is that to be able to get a, a card from the mid sixties of an MVP for $2 shipped? Like yeah. you can't beat it. So there's just so many, so many ways that Don, I don't know. Do you, do you have any, uh, uh, maybe not in, in the same exact. Um, yeah. I mean, the cards are made more of people that I know behind them, personal stories than they do actually the games. Um, I mean, like, you know, I just showed that 56 man out from his trip or crown year. That was just coincidence. I didn't buy it for that reason. I just happened to have it. And I'm sure I have some other cards like that. Uh, but I've never thought of collecting that way. But that's that's what's awesome about having these shows and talking to people. It's kind of opened my eyes to that. Like, not that I need more avenues to go down, collecting <laughs> cards, but you know, it's uh, it's kind of neat. I, I like the idea a lot. My my intent was to wreck your focus, so then later in the second part of the episode, we can talk about a lack of focus. But yeah, that I, I actually did pull a pirates related one. You know, with you in mind on that, uh, you'll probably find cool. So. You know, the, the big uh, game in 1970 where uh, Doc Ellis pitched the, you know, allegedly LSD-infused no uh, hitter. No hitter. Right. So, you know, I, I think that's a cool story like a lot of baseball yeah. fans do. I don't know how much truth there is to it or not, but 
So I picked up for five bucks a while back his 1970 Tops card just because that's the season that it happened. And right. um, I just thought it was cool to have a link, you know, to that story in my collection. It's a beautiful looking card too. And yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, fun way to collect. That's not a lot of money. And every time I look at this card, I'll think of that kind of crazy story of a game. And then I have a, a newer card to go with it. It's kind of like a two card collection, but Tops, when they did the Project 70, uh, mm -hmm. Art cards a couple of years back, they did one, you know, dedicated to the LSD <laughs> no hitter. So he's in the that. foreground here pitching, and yeah. you know, in the background, the batter is kind of transforming from a batter <laughs> holding a bat to Jimi Hendrix <laughs> holding a guitar. That's uh, wild. I've never seen love it. Yeah. So you know, those two cards together, I think grand total, I probably spent about twenty bucks on these. But um, that's just another example of kind of a link to a, a cool event in baseball history and a, right. a cheap approach that you can take. One of the guys that I I, I did, I, so earlier I said I never really thought about collecting this way, but I guess I did because I was looking at one point at getting a Johnny Vandermeer card because he mm -hmm. threw the two no-hitters two games in a row. Yep. I'm like, well, that'll be a great card. It won't be that expensive yep. and wrong. <laughs> it's, not, it's not crazy expensive, but it wasn't as cheap as I was hoping. So I kind of never went further with that or, or a Don Larson game from card from the perfect. Well, one of my big hobby regrets is uh, I was watching a Larson autographed 56 card years back and it had inscribed, you know, world series, no hitter underneath and everything. And I just, I don't know why I didn't buy it. It sold out from under me. I haven't seen one since, but yeah, that's another great, great right. example. Uh, w one card that I had looked into because uh, I was again, watching someone's video and they brought this up, and I thought it was just a really cool story. So I I, I looked up some of the cards. I'm like, yeah, wait, is it? Uh, I think his first name's Mo Mo Berg. Oh, Mo Berg. He was the spy. Spy in World War II. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, what a just amazing story. I I, I I'm sure there's more more to it. It was just what they were explaining in the video. I think maybe someone wrote a book about it. Um, and I'm yeah. like, oh, that would be a, a cool card to get. Well. Yeah, you go look up a Mo Berg card if you can find one. Yeah, they're and, <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not cheap. Now i I have a couple cards here that I that I pulled that it's not in the same vein, Shane, of what you're going at in terms of maybe directly tying uh, a, a card to a specific sporting event uh, or a milestone or something, but ones that and and I've I've talked about it on other videos before, but these were the main ones that just they always come to mind. Uh, that they're they're cards of uh, a specific card or a player that have a, a special meaning to me in 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 some way. They're certainly not Hall of Famers by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the first one is, and I think this is a 19, 1940 play ball. Let's see if I can. Oh, I know the story behind this one. Of Gene Desitel. I remember you showing a great card. Yeah. And uh, I, I forget this maybe cost me 10 bucks or something like that. Okay. <laughs> now the, the background of the story here is my uh, mom grew up in Massachusetts um, in uh, Southbridge, which is not too far from the Connecticut border. Shane, you may be near Sturbridge, old Sturbridge. Yeah. Village. You may I actually there. went to high school in Woodstock, which is like one town South of Southbridge. I yeah. learned to play golf at the Woodstock golf course, the nine, the nine hole, that little <laughs> municipal. There you go. Oh my gosh. Okay. I, I, I never been there. Never heard of <laughs> <laughs> well, the Gene Desitel uh, was born in Worcester, Mass in 1907 and about the same age as my grandmother and at one point maybe when he was in minor league ball i think he went to holy cross which is in worcester um supposedly at some point before he made it to the majors he asked my grandmother out on a date <laughs> and she said no because i think at the time she was dating my would become grandfather they dated for like seven or eight years before they got married. Uh, both their their parents died at early age and they had a bunch of kids. So they had to like leave school, get jobs, take care of their younger kids and stuff. So even when they were a little, a little bit older and dating age, 
Um, they said, hey, we can't get married because we have family obligations. And so once those younger kids were grown up, then they ended up getting married and were married for like 60 years or something like that. But uh, supposedly because we were I, I forget how it came up in conversation, maybe about baseball cards I was collecting. And my grandma was like, yeah, there's this guy, Red. He called him Red, Gene, but Red Desitel. <laughs> and it's you, his first name is technically Eugene A. Desitel. Uh, but he went by like Red Desitel. And I'm like, I wonder if there are any cards. He has two cards, a 40 uh, play ball and maybe a 41. I couldn't find a 41, but I found this uh, 1940. He was a catcher uh, for the Red Sox, played a few years. Uh, nothing, again, special. Uh, but he's, she's like, yeah, he, he asked me out one time. And yeah, I think he made it to the majors or something like that. And sure enough, that so that... Again, I wouldn't know anything about this unless my grandmother said something about it, but it's just a special tie. And, of course, the famous one that I have, which got me into collecting baseball cards seriously, was the 79 Bump Wills. <laughs> and this is the – I learned about this in Little League. I started collecting in 78. So this is only the second year that I really started buying packs of cards and found out that hey there's an error version with the blue jays down at the bottom there instead of the rangers and but this is the corrected one that i guess was rare you know harder to find than the error the error was out there for longer uh than the corrected one and at the time so i'm said is he 79 i'm seven years old and at the time i i still have the note that my mom wrote down of different prices of errors. And it was, <laughs> yeah, you need to look for the 1979 Bump Wills card. Uh, if it has the Blue Jays on the front, it's worth $3. If it has the Rangers <laughs> on the front, the corrected version, it was worth $7. Now, again, a seven-year-old in 1979, and I go through looking through my box of cards, and I find not only the, the uh, Bump Wills, but the corrected version is worth seven dollars, and I'm like, oh my god, this this is worth. I get fifty cents allowance a week. Fifty cents a week for an allowance, and this is worth seven dollars. And so that again, it wasn't a, a money thing, but it 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 just just jump started my interest in the hobby. I I don't know if without this card, if I would have gone off and done other things, and maybe just never had any big interest in uh, collecting baseball cards uh, but that just kept my focus like wow there's th th that's cool and all this stuff and so as i started collecting vintage cards i had to get a psa 9 nice. of the i got the uh, really nice psa 9 copy of the corrected was that I had to get a psa 9 copy of the error Love it. Now I have my original card in my collection, which I'll never get rid of. And now I have two bump wills again. Bump wills. No, no big player, but just because of that error, uh it it just has so much special meaning to me as part of my collection. So I wanted two really nice copies of the the, the corrected and the error that really got me into collecting. Yeah, I think that's a great point, too, because in the same way that not every one of these has to be a Hall of Fame player, not every one of these moments has to be, you know, one of these huge moments like, you know, Carlton Fisk's home run in game six of the 75 World Series. Yeah, you know, they, they can be much smaller things that you just have a personal tie to. Like, I, I picked up one example here, and this is a good um, modern uh, version of this is Tops Now. Um, so I went to a game. Uh, about, geez, I guess it was six years ago now, got tickets through work and found out as the game got closer that it was actually the David Ortiz number retirement ceremony game. Uh, and John, I know I heard uh, your story with going up with a bunch of buddies to see the Boggs uh, ceremonies. This was the same thing for Ortiz and, you know, had a bunch of his teammates there and Red Sox legends. Uh, Yaz was there, other, other players. And uh, it was just a really fun night. I went with my lifelong best friend, my wife, and it, his longtime girlfriend went out to dinner first and it was just a really great evening and tops produced, you know, tops now cards, you know, for that event. Uh, there's two of them, you know, one Ortiz by himself, you know, at the, at the podium. And then, uh, 
you know, one with Pedro Martinez as well, nice. um, you know, from the ceremony. So these are, you know, these cost $4 each, $5 each, but um, they're, you know, a great way for me to remember that evening. And so I, I think tops now, you know, these aren't cards that you collect because they're valuable or they're going to increase in value or anything like that. But if you happen to catch a game or have a memory, you know, related to a game that you went to, then it's just really oh. cool. Oh, is that when you were at Tom? Yeah. So um, this is last summer. This was when two holes passed a rod for number four on the list. And I was with Scott Reindeer Studios, Dean Gearhart Jr. and my son. And it's that also awesome. a day. So Scott got these made for us, or not made, he, he bought them up at Tops right. and sent it to me. And he sent one for my son. And that was also the day he presented his art piece to me. So it's uh it's pretty cool that we have a card from a game that I went to went with with two YouTubers and, and my son. I, I love that concept. It's like it, you know, yeah. that's that's gotta be one of the more meaningful cards in your collection just because of you know linking it back to that I, experience. I kneeling or leaning right against the piece he made me because it's all from like that day. So but all I right, got well, a show. Yeah. What's that? I, I was gonna say maybe maybe this would be a good uh, chance here since we're about forty five minutes in to uh, to maybe pause with the trivia question and then move on to the the second topic there of, of, of focus. So, all right. um, are you are you ready, Don? I'm ready. All right. Well, this is up for you as, as well, Shane. Again, it I don't think it's that hard, but we'll see. What did Babe Ruth, Rogers Hornsby? Ted Williams and Willie Mays all do in their first major league at bat. So you got Ruth, Hornsby, Ted Williams, and Willie Mays. Struck out. Yeah, I was, I, I was tempted to say like the obvious, like hit a home run, but right. I want to say like walked maybe. <laughs> all right, James with a walk, Don's with a home run or uh, with a strike. Right. I said you said strike. Out. And Don is correct. Nice. All four of those great all-time players in the history of the game, their first at-bat, they struck out. <laughs> so, well, Shane, uh, home run was the first thought in my mind. Too. I'm like, that's too hard. I, I, I figured that's why that I, I thought that hey, maybe. But, you know, Shane, you had a good approach because, okay, a home run uh, is too obvious. Oh, maybe a strikeout, maybe too obvious. So what would be next? What would be a non to maybe a walk? Class over overthinking, classic overthinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So the 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 next uh, topic here that we'll we'll sort of wrap things uh, up here is you know all this sort of having a focus and do we lose? Have we lost focus in the past? What has it been on? How do we maybe get back uh, to having set? Because there's so many cards out there, so many ways to collect. We've already talked about you know, alternative, maybe alternative ways, uh, so to speak, of collecting is how do we stay on focus? And when we, you know, what are some of the things maybe that we've lost our focus on? Yeah, so both Shane, of you to me seem seem like pretty focused uh, individuals, at least from what I can see. Um, I know obviously John with Wade Boggs and, and, you know, then your vintage pursuit and your 100 cards for 100K and uh, Don with your vintage collection and, and being a Pirates fan. So I was just curious. For me, it's a, a huge struggle. And I don't necessarily want to paint the picture that it's always a bad thing. Because I, I think like anything else, it's good to have a healthy balance. And if I try to just be ultra focused all the time, my hobby feels less fun to me. And it starts to feel like a, a little bit more like a chore, which I don't want either. But yeah. at the same time, I think I'm on the complete uh, opposite end of the spectrum where I'm just all over the map and I, I have a very difficult time focusing. So I was just curious, you know, how your experiences have been and uh, whether you've had any kind of side avenues that you've gone down and maybe what you use to keep yourself focused, if, if yeah. anything. Well, I think it's easier for me because I don't collect modern. So that's a whole genre I don't have to worry about, you know, taking my eye away from the prize per se. Um, and I'm pretty, pretty good at being focused. It's usually Hall of Fame players and mostly post. I dab a little bit in, in pre-war, but not a ton. Um, and But recently, like the 1950 Bowman Hall of Fame run, I need three cards. 
And I see myself looking at cars going, oh, that's a that's a nice car. Or how about that? You know, it's only 20 bucks, it's only 40 bucks. And then I buy five or six of them. I'm like, I could have bought that one card <laughs> the same amount that I bought all these other cards that I like, but now I'm not done with a set. And every once in a while, I'll veer off. Like I, I started buying a few basketball cards recently. Nice. And they're CSG and they're cheap and they're Hall of Famers. Earl Monroe. I think I got that for twelve dollars. <laughs> I think I got this Dave Bing for twenty, maybe twenty-five. Awesome. So I'm not gonna go crazy. You're not gonna see a shelf of basketball cards behind me. <laughs> <laughs> but I do veer off. You know, here's a Mel Blunt Hall of Fame card that I bought. So it, it is a little nice sometimes to veer off a little bit. I think. I, I think you touched on like the the strife of uh a lot of collectors is like uh you want to stay engaged in the hobby with those little buys you know frequently but it's like uh death by a thousand paper cuts uh scenario right. you know? right. <laughs> oh. yeah I, go ahead john no, no i i think i think for when i was looking uh i just scroll through all your your video shane and yet yeah, definitely there's a whole bunch of stuff that you collect. I'm like, oh, there's a video on this and then that. And then, you know, oh, he switched to, to some modern cards. And here's some vintage. Here's some pre-bore. Oh, here's some hockey. And here's some, and, you know, so some autograph cards. And I think for some people, and, and, and maybe you fit into that, is it, that's that's fine. That's how, like you said, you you don't get in a rut. You don't get to, you know, trying to f- focus on getting that one card or a couple cards and, you never see one up on eBay or when someone does like they want to, you know, fortune for it. And you can get frustrated of like, all I want is this one card, but I can't find one or this or that or whatever. And, you know, you could, by focusing too much, you could get maybe frustrated because you can't do what you want to do for, for, for various reasons. Um, I know if I just started going off on, you know, getting some, you know, modern players and vintage and this or, or whatever. I, one, it's okay. Limited funds. And what, what area brings me joy more than others? Cause I know I can't do it all. So it's, if I have $20, $50, $100 dollars to spend, what would give me the most satisfaction in adding to my collection? And again, sometimes it's changed, and I have had a, a squirrel moment. I've I've sort of gone away from from picking up some recently, uh, but they're the uh, you know modern cards, but it's the the short print image variations of of Hall of Famers. So you know, here's a I forget, I'm not sure what year, but here's a you know a Paul Molitor. So you have some modern players or more more modern players, but here's a, this Willie McCovey. And that card, John. You got Hank Aaron there. So, and again, these some of these. I mean, they're short prints, so they're not. Uh, go back to the McCovey. Card. Card. Hmm? Go back to the McCovey card a minute. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. The second one you showed. Yeah. That'll fit mm-hmm. into what we were. Was it last week? Oh, uh, Johnny Bench. Yeah. yeah. I just it's yeah. Tough. Good good eye there. Yeah, and, and yeah. just to, oh, oh, sorry. No, but you you can get it. It's a it's a cheap way of picking up cards of Hall of Famers. Now there are some short prints that are super short prints that I mean you could be spending a hundred or two hundred dollars on a modern card of say a, a Babe Ruth super short print. And I'm like, okay, well no. If I have if I'm going to spend a hundred dollars like that, it, it's going to be for a, a vintage card. But and so I you know here's. You know, this was over a, maybe a year, maybe a little bit over a year. And a lot of these I picked up for five, six bucks or, you know, a lot where I was in for $4. And a couple I paid maybe $10 for, um, bigger Hall of Fame players. Uh, maybe the odds of pulling one were a little bit higher, not necessarily a super short print. Um, but as, as I, I got a lot of the low hanging fruit. And so when I started getting, okay, now these cards with shipping, they're going to start costing me 15 bucks at a minimum, maybe 20 or more. I'm like, oh, well, okay. 
I again, if I had that money, would I rather buy say a seventy-five tops Hall of Famer for twenty bucks, or a modern of a? So, I, not that I um wouldn't go back to adding more of those, but I think the hey, I want to start searching for them. I want to start picking them up, and and adding to my collection has sort of faded away, and I've gone back to again Boggs and vintage hall of famers so it was a slight tangent that who knows me i may get back to another one is complete sets that's how i sort of started early on i buy packs but the big thing was you wanted to get the complete set of all the cards and i did that for a while and then the sets just started exploding in the late 90s i mean all the different card companies and then each card company was putting out three or four different sets and i'm like okay i got the tops flagship maybe a score and donorous or upper deck okay so there's four maybe five so like, every year i'm like it's just it's i i, I takes up a lot of space too you, you have to build a whole wing on your new house to, to hold all your sets yeah all the binders behind you there shane it's yeah yeah i've, I've had a set building phase myself but I've, I've got out of that years ago for the same reasons uh yeah. you know just too much to keep up with but I occasionally go and and I'll I'll pick up a, uh, a factory set like one of the Walmart uh, factory sets series one series two. Uh, I've been a little lax in maybe picking up the updated set because you have to just go out and buy a hand you know get a hand collated one off of eBay or something um, of, of the the more recent ones. So I still have a gap in like the uh, late nineties into some of the early two thousand years. Uh, but you know, I'd like to maybe one day have a a run, whether it's a, a you know a hand collated set or a factory set of every tops set. Well, I, I'm working on building a 78. I don't have a 79, but from 1980, you know, on up, it you know it'd be nice to have and maybe put some of them in binders to look through to actually enjoy the card rather than having it. Oh. Yeah, I have a complete set there. It's in a box and it's all cellophane wrapped and it's on a shelf there. You can't enjoy the cards because they're all in it. So I, I've struggled with what I'm going to do there right now. I don't have the space. and I'm going to have less space in the new house until I finish the basement. Maybe when the basement's done and I can have, Shane, like your setup there, I can have some bookshelves that can handle binders that maybe I'll go back to my original roots and break out some of those handsets that I just have now in cardboard boxes, put them in binders, maybe figure out what to do with some of those factory sets or just keep those factory sets and then buy handsets that I can put in. Bi Again, it's a it's another squirrel out there, but I think it could give me some enjoyment. I don't know how long it would last, though. So, Well, br bring it around full circle. I, I love your or I share your love for the, uh, the short print variations. And I have one actually that I pulled for uh, the the uh, video here that kind of ties the first topic together being a moment in time on one of those. I picked it up recently, but it's the uh, Cal Ripken Jr. from the, the day that he broke, you know, the record and, yeah. uh, you know, celebrating afterwards on the back of the Corvette there at Camden Yards. Um, and that, that's just an event that I remember. I was like, I just turned 13 years old. And that was like a very, very uh, formidable event in my you know, passed as a baseball fan and just becoming a Cal Ripken fan. So that was a cool one that I picked up recently. I, I, I don't have, have many tops, the tops now, the Tohe and the Trout. And I've never bought any of those tops now from them. But I was like, you know, I, I saw that live. And it was such a cool moment. I'm like, I think I want that. I picked up cool. one of those too. That's yeah. a killer example, actually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I sort of stopped, Shane, with those short print image variations probably around the end of 2021, or at least I didn't uh, start doing a checklist and trying to go after the 2021 or 2022 cards. But the only two I have are there's one with Reggie Jackson and then one with a uh, cool image of, you know, talk about a, a maybe player not with a significant specific moment, but just for the game a uh jackie robinson oh nice beautiful in fact i i want to say and I, I i i i can't remember i think someone maybe gifted this to me i have to check one of my, my one of my videos but uh so i don't have again that you the one that you showed off was because i was like man do i have that ripkin 
And when you say it was from 2022, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, uh, I only have a couple from from 2022. All the other ones are the older uh, versions. If, if we have one minute here, I know we're at an hour, but I have a oh, couple, yeah. a couple yeah. of Wade Boggs cards that I just wanted to show real quick because I figured yeah. it, was, it was the perfect time for it. But um, one I had a question on, and it kind of, not to put you on the spot, but it kind of ties to the uh, the subject tonight, too, in terms of being a moment. So this is one of the, and what we just brought up with the short print variations. This is a Wade Boggs. I've been told this is his his 3,000th career hit, the home run. Yes. I believe yep. it is. I, I looked up a video. It looks like the same jersey, and he did point up like that as he, he you know, between first and second. So I, yes. I think yep, that's exactly. It. Yep, that's when he hit his three thousandth hit, a home run, and when he was going from first to second base, uh, he he reached up in the in the sky to his mom. Perfect. I, I knew you would know. Uh, you were the perfect person to confirm with. And then I have two kind of cool autos that I figured you'd appreciate. Um, one is I, I'm sure you know this card. Obviously the. Yes, 87 classic where he's got the rubber chicken um, yep. with the bat. So I found an autographed version recently. I've shown this one before, but oh, it, nice. he I actually can... inscribed it as uh, Chicken Man. So yep. um, I collect autogra uh, you know, autographs on and off. And then this, the last one is, is unique. So I mentioned I was in the blogging world, and a guy that I was friendly with, he makes custom cards. He just makes his own cards. He's pretty talented, prints them out, and... I don't know if you're familiar with the the episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yep. Comedy show where they try to redo the, the Wade Boggs beer challenge when they're flying across the country. So yep. he made a custom card of that episode and then sent a copy to Wade and had him autograph it. And yep. he gave it away as as part of a contest. And I won the card. And oh. so this is this is the card. I have, uh, I have that card. Turn. I have that. I, I, I'd have to look to see what, what year I have it assigned. I have that. Yeah, so pretty cool. Have sold some on eBay. I have that exact card not signed, but that, yeah. that is that is awesome. Too yeah. funny. Yeah, his name was Gavin. He, he, he I think he still writes a blog, but he did a great job with that. And I thought it was a pretty unique, uh, unique take on a Wade Boggs card. So yeah, somehow he may have put or maybe a third party or, or something. Uh there weren't many, I, it wasn't uh shown as P like a, a, a one of one. Uh, right. but I, I have bought a whole ton of these art cards. And when you said that, and it was funny, I'm like, I wonder if that's in the, yeah, the, the 1990 flare design. Yeah. That's um, too. I mean, he did a, he did back a back card back and everything. So it's pretty well done. It's funny. Yeah. And you have that now I was at the, I think it was at the, the Philadelphia show late last year. Um, someone was in line with me for, for, for Wade Boggs and he had Wade sign his rookie card and put chicken man. <laughs> Funny. so yeah uh don anything else that uh you want to discuss bring up it's your turn next for uh a guest so do you have anyone in mind here oh i think we somehow lost shane did he I just take him off <laughs> see my around yours just run wow you think wow. we were yeah, I don't know what I I yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he comes back on. I want to thank him for, for being on the show here. But uh do, do you have any thoughts for uh for who we could have as the uh, next guest? I haven't to be honest, I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it. Um hey, am I back? <laughs> yeah, well we can hear you, we can't see you. Yeah, I can't see you. Oh, there you, there go. you go. All right. We, we thought, started, wow, you took the legs and you, you started hearing the, you know, the Academy of Mic music. drop. You know, it's, it's time to leave. You know, it's like, we weren't pushing like an hour. I'm out. That's all I promised you was an hour. You're not getting a minute more. I, for, I forgot to silence my phone. I got a phone call as we were wrapping up and it locked up my, uh, oh. locked up my phone. <laughs> so we were just talking about who we're going to have on next week. So we got to figure, or next episode, not necessarily next week. Um, but... I'm actually going to the Strongsville card show, not this weekend, but next weekend. And okay. with some YouTubers there. Um, so I might ask one of them. Now that's what the in Ohio? Yeah, it's a suburb of Cleveland. So okay. um Scott will be there, Reindeer Studios, and I know Nina going? who? Nina. I don't know if she's going or not. I, I want to say she has something going on with her family. But I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Have a, you say that's next week? 
Yeah. I'll, so it'll be a week from when this happens so okay. yeah, on Sunday. So yeah, good. Yeah. We'll have a, have a great time. So yeah, yeah we'll, we'll we'll try to figure out here. And if if I need to, it seems I'm doing all the work here. No, I'll I'll find out. I'll maybe uh, get a guest, and we'll 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 figure something uh, out. Who are you so, kidding? No. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, I, this was great this is the first time you and i have spoken um we've watched each other's well i don't know if you've watched mine but i've watched yours for a while and uh love what you do and i'm glad john reached out to you and, and that you agreed to come on it was it was awesome having you on it's a great yeah, idea i'm honored I, I had a blast i really enjoy both of your channels and your your approaches to collecting and uh it was just great catching up so yeah, absolutely Hour went by fast yeah, yeah it does, it does. Yeah. So, hey, uh, with that, again, Shane, thank you uh, very much. And to all of you uh, watching, thanks for checking this episode of Two Guys, One Hobby. And we'll be back sometime with another episode. So until then, hey, thanks for watching. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, John. Take care.